Last year at this event, you had the opportunity to hear from uh, my friend Mike Murphy from Sharp Healthcare. And I think Mike talked about the uh, Affordable Care Act as it was developing, talked about what was about to hit us all, and that were the health benefit exchanges. And then he shared a bit about Sharp's remarkable journey. So today, uh, we wanted to take kind of the next evolution to where we're all moving, and that's talk about population health which, like uh, the letters ACO, are a bit of a buzzword, uh, a bit overused. Uh, however, it's what we should have been doing all along, and I think all of us kind of know that and feel that, except that we didn't have the systems or the processes or the delivery sites or the uh, integration, and we certainly weren't reimbursed in a manner that rewards a focus on maintaining the health of a population. So by way of uh, further introduction, uh, let me share a bit about the Memorial Care Health System for two reasons. One, just to let you know from whence I come and, and the orientation that I have. Uh, but also, I, I think it's a, it's a bit of a story on uh, a health system that has evolved over the years. We have roots dating back with our five, uh, six hospitals uh, 107 years. And for roughly 100 of those years, the hospitals operated entirely independent of one another, sometimes pretending that the other didn't exist. I suspect board members of one hospital had never seen another hospital uh, in the health system. Uh, but around the year 2000, we decided it was time to begin behaving like a system and reaping the benefits uh, that being part of a system brings. And we had no idea then what all that could be. And so we've connected the hospitals with the same installation of Epic, our EMR, installed in the exact same way and used by clinicians in the exact same way. We also created a few years ago what we call our Shared Services Center, which is growing significantly, where today uh, virtually every conceivable back office and infrastructure that supports a hospital or an ambulatory care center is done in one location by people who are working together. So we're able to bring significant efficiencies and economies to all of the entities, as well as levels of expertise that not one of them alone could probably afford or, or recruit for. In the last few years, literally maybe uh, three or four years, we've decided it was time to move out of the hospital business, appreciating that that's what we've done uh, for the lion's share of our, our 107 years, and move more into the ambulatory arena. And that came by way of adding two rather significant physician divisions. Now, the way we went about this, like many of you, uh, in fact, I, probably many of you were, were ahead of us, Memorial Care, as we understand it, uh, was the last health system in the state of California to create a physician division under the umbrella of the 1206L, the medical foundation, which, in, as you know, in California is required uh, to indirectly employ physicians. Uh, we created that just four years ago. And we thought, well, we can go about this and start identifying physicians who were approaching us to become more integrated with the health system and join the family. We could cobble it together ourselves. We've run businesses for several years. We have big computer systems and lots of people. Surely we can run a physician practice. But we wisely said, surely we're wrong. Uh, so why don't we go out and if we can find a group that sh shares similar values to us, that is culturally like us, that has a vision like us, uh, that has a quality of reputation, uh, and more importantly, or maybe uh, equally as important, has an infrastructure of, uh, unto themselves that is both ro robust and scalable. Because once we would bring them into the family, we wanted to grow them dramatically throughout the health system. And that's what we did three or four years ago with the acquisition of the Bristol Park Medical Group, a group that had been around for 50 years the week we acquired them, and brought them into the family. And just to give an indication of the, the robustness of their, of their systems, their information system, their, their IT room in their, in their data center actually serves as a backup for our health system. So this is not you know, your, your, your little medical group. They were rather substantial and we've been able to grow upon them. They've now tripled, more than tripled in size since they were brought into the family. But we knew that physicians, not all of them want to work in that particular model. Uh, and we wanted to reach physicians where they were. We have what we refer to as a pluralistic approach of working with physicians and partnering with them and integrating with them. And uh, many physicians want to maintain an independent practice. But IPAs, too, can be much more integrated than they have been with health systems. And so we've, we've, we're going to go on one of, one of three paths, either cobble together our own IPA, after all, how difficult could it be, 
or take the specialty IPA that was part of our medical group that had some four or 500 contracted physicians and just move that to become a primary care IPA. But wisely, we chose the same path we chose when we did our medical group, and that is go out and find an existing organization that shares similar values, that has the same vision we do, that has an infrastructure that is both robust and scalable. And hence the partnership with Greater Newport Physicians, an IPA that had been around for 27 years. Since then, we've grown that organization as well. So that's allowed our footprint to grow, and we've now added uh, urgent care centers, imaging centers, ambulatory surgery centers. In fact, I think I have one or both ASCs or ambulatory imaging centers a month coming before the board for the next six months. Uh, they're coming in, in rapid succession as we expand out into the community. And then a year ago, uh, we were approached by UCI, someone we have been working in partnership with for over 40 years on graduate medical education and research. And they uh, determined that as a largely quaternary uh, organization, he heavily specialist driven, they needed to branch out into primary care into the community. And they went through a process thinking, well, we can create it ourselves, which will take time and take money. We could partner with someone in the UC family, which makes remarkable sense because some of the other UC hospitals have growing physician divisions. Or we can find someone in our own community who has an infrastructure that is robust and scalable, someone who can serve as kind of the, the back office of our physician expansion, and hence the partnership between Memorial Care and UCI where they have a, in a certain geographic area in north central Orange County, uh, they have effectively free reign to go out and identify physicians or physician groups, bring them into the UC Irvine Health family. Uh, they then lease those physicians to us and we run all the operations. So we have all the managed care, all the back office, all the real estate. And the, one of the benefits for Memorial Care, in addition to expanding this partnership with UCI, is that the physicians are under our managed care contracts, which immediately expands our network. Uh, and I'm happy to say just actually one week ago today, or I think it was last week, uh, they opened their first two offices and as the day they opened, they had 1,200 appointments already uh, set for those physicians. So these were not uh, new grads, these were existing physicians in the community. And then beyond that, we're now looking to continue expanding uh, yeah, toward in, into LA, uh, into the Inland Empire, and maybe even a bit down toward San Diego. And it may not be through the traditional means, which is a uh, merger acquisition, more likely to be, not exclusively, but more likely to be through continued partnerships and affiliations, one of which I'll talk about a little bit later today. And I think one other element of the health system, uh, which we got into not knowing exactly what it would do for us, but knowing that it was a, a tool to have in our toolbox, and that is uh, a year ago we brought uh, operational our uh, health plan. Uh, Seaside Health Plan, which I think was supposed to be on this map, covering roughly that gray area uh, to the inside of the crescent and toward the ocean is where it's licensed uh, as a full service health plan. Uh, it uh, today has 20,000 lives. As of February 1, it'll have 35,000 lives. Uh, so it's growing rather rapidly, both in a plan-to-plan -plan relationship, which is to say we are a health plan operating under another health plan, or now, as we have been approved by the Department of Managed Healthcare, in a direct relationship uh, with Medicare Advantage, commercial clients, individual markets, or the health benefit exchange. Just a quick few uh, tidbits about the Memorial Care Health System. Uh, certainly, as, as I've presented data like this over the years and presentations, we've had to evolve it because we have made that evolution from being a system of hospitals uh, to an integrated delivery system where we think about things like medical group visits and imaging center uh, studies, et cetera. And this, these are some of the mo uh, fastest expanding areas uh, for our health system. So I wanted to focus on population health and whoops, where better than to start with Dr. Berwick's work with the triple aim. We all know it, we know it well, but that will be my guiding uh, uh, force as I go throughout the balance of, of my slides. Let me start with this slide, and you can imagine what's happening here uh, in our state. Uh, anybody wanna hazard a guess at what development is going on before your very eyes and think about things that might impact our world? Somebody said obesity, maybe. Well, that would be a good guess, given how much it's changing. Actually, this is the drought map. I was just messing with you. Um, 
I saw that in the newspaper, and I said, I've got to have that. <laughs> I don't know what I'll do with it, but I've got to have it. That is, I, it is literally the drought map for the state of California. More importantly, however, might be this one. And this is a bit concerning. Let me actually just pause it here just to orient you to the chart. You've seen this before, and every time I see this, it disturbs me deeply. Uh, and this is the uh, BMI percent of a uh, population that is over a BMI of 30. And you can see back in 1986 when this chart begins, we had uh, effectively three areas. Heck, roughly half the states had no data available. They weren't tracking it, didn't have any idea of that aspect of their population in their states. But you can see the categories less than 10, 10 to 14, 15 to 19, and how the states were arrayed. And as we roll the clock forward over the course of time, a disturbing trend occurs, and we know a trend that is impacting healthcare significantly for our population. So you roll the clock forward to 1995, and we have all the states that are sitting 10 to 14 or 15 to 19. Then we had to do something that frankly is rather shameful, add three more categories of body mass index because we continue to get fatter. Uh, and you can see now the clock rolling forward uh, to 2000 and beyond the state of Colorado being kind of the highlight for the most part, uh, but even the state of Colorado can't maintain their rather svelte status where now they have over 20% of their population uh, is above body mass index of 30. And you can see where the rest of the states are as well. This is impacting our health system and the health of our population significantly. And quite frankly, it's not something that most health systems, certainly most hospitals, have focused a lot of time on because it wasn't something we could impact very much. But if we want to call ourselves managers of population health, we've got to do something about this disturbing trend. You know the data. Uh, now, uh, since 1970, over 30% of Americans uh, are, are overweight. It's increasing dramatically. And what's the impact? Uh, it's costing us about $200 billion a year that researchers can identify uh, body mass index over 30 with certain health conditions and the cost. What could you do with $200 billion? Well, you could buy a membership to an exclusive gym for every man, woman, and child in the United States every single year. You could buy two boxes of organic fruits and vegetables and give them every week to every family in America. Or you could buy a bicycle, you could buy roller skates and a swimsuit and pay for swim lessons for every child in the country. And it would make a, you know, that, that would be, make a significant impact on this expenditure of $200 billion on obesity. I was giving a talk uh, a couple of years ago in Canada uh, with a fellow uh, uh, from the state of Arkansas which is not necessarily known for svelte of population. Uh, I hope I didn't insult anybody. I'm from Missouri, so when you're from Missouri, you can pretty much get away saying anything about any state. <laughs> and he introduced himself as the Surgeon General of Arkansas. And I said, I didn't know there was a Surgeon General of Arkansas. My state of California doesn't have a Surgeon General, and for God's sake, we're the largest state in the country. Um, I didn't know it. Only two states at that time, the United States had Surgeon Generals, and he happened to be a pediatrician. And so his focus was on childhood obesity. He did the same chart I just showed you nationally for the state of Arkansas, county by county, and identified a disturbing trend of the kids' body mass index at younger and younger ages. And so he, he started a program years ago that is just beginning to demonstrate its value of removing sugary beverages from the schools, increasing the uh, time they spend in activities, uh, and, and also working with their families to help encourage a healthier lifestyle. It's truly remarkable what can be done in that arena. The other major area that, again, as healthcare providers, we haven't worked in as much as we should have, and that's chronic health. You know the statistics, the number one cause of death and disability in the United States. 133 uh, million Americans have at least one chronic disease. Many of them, most of them, have more than one chronic disease. That's almost half the population of our country is living with at least one chronic disease. And what does it do? Well, it kills them. Uh, 1.7 million Americans are killed each year by chronic diseases. That's seven in 10 deaths that occur in our country every single year linked to chronic diseases that are, for all intents and purposes, manageable if we had the tools and the processes and the behavioral modification uh, along the way. So that's where I want to focus some of my time. Now, this chart is simple, but it's one that disturbs me because as a health system like many of you from where, where you come from that has been around a long time serving your community, 
most of our time and attention and our entities and our sites and our delivery systems are focused on that sliver to the left, the blue one. That's, that's the impact on population health that can come from the healthcare organization. That's access, that's delivery sites, that those are best practice protocols, et cetera. Genetics, how you're, what you're born with, uh, comprises another 20%. And certainly we're gonna be seeing over the course of, certainly what our lifetimes, uh, the impact to begin to change genetics and alter them to some degree to improve the health of a population. That will be an exciting development. But a full 60% of what impacts the health of a population is social, behavioral, and environmental. And we don't touch that too much. But again, if we endeavor to be population health managers, we believe we must touch that. And two areas where we can touch that significantly is in the, the, the weight of the population, the obesity rates, and the extent of chronic disease. So where does that take us? And back to Memorial Care's journey toward being a population health manager. The, what you see before you, the four quadrants of this circle, are what uh, I've been using uh, in our health system with our management teams, our physician leaders, uh, throughout the entire organization, our, the governance of our organization. Uh, the four uh, strategic themes that drive everything we do fall into one or more of these categories, whether it be growth, expanding geographically and by scale, focusing on partnerships, expanding our own health plan and working more closely with other health plans. Uh, the integration side, which is uh, a little bit like population health and ACO, a terribly overused term and, and one that, that many are not doing very well. I can't tell you how many health systems, as I had the chance to travel throughout the state of California and the country I look at, that are doing the right thing strategically. They're diversifying, they're expanding, they're uh, geographically as well as across the continuum of care, but they're stopping short at full and complete integration. And it's the only way, I believe, you can get the, the most value out of these integrated delivery systems that we're building. And when I say integration, I mean cultural integration. A quick story, one of the transactions we did uh, that led up to the, our health system evolving from a system of hospitals to an integrated delivery system, uh, we were still in negotiations uh, to go through this financial transaction to bring in this partner. And we brought in an outside party that we'd worked with in the past that focused on cultural assessment and alignment of, of cultures and, and visions while we were still negotiating with this party. And, 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 and said, we, we need to set these folks up to interview some of your managers and some of your staff and some of your physicians. And they said, wait a minute, you're being mighty presumptuous. We're still negotiating with you and a few other parties as far as you know. Uh, and now you're bringing in your consultants to talk about cultural in, uh, engagement and cultural integration. And we said, don't worry, we're paying for it. And so if the transaction doesn't come to fruition, then it's my problem, it's my expense. Uh, but trust me, if we come to a transaction, you will appreciate the work that was done. And they began focusing on making sure as we came together, we knew what we both wanted to accomplish. And that if our cultures were different and they're bound to vary, that we were moving toward a more common culture. And the benefit has been mind blowing. In fact, this organization uh, protected themselves, I'd say wisely, they had good legal counsel by saying, you know, we've got a pretty robust infrastructure here, it's what you're buying, and, uh, but we're concerned that you may cannibalize it and take it apart. And so for three years, you can't touch our infrastructure without our, 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 our approval. Not unreasonable to ask. Within less than six months, they were already merging their systems and processes and people into ours. That's integration. And now it's completely integrated such that the original organization is not recognizable as, as, it, as its own. On the lower left side, value creation that's focusing on pay for performance and value-based purchasing, something that we're going to continue to live with and will expand. We all need to continue reducing costs, and I'll touch upon that a little bit. And lean, like in many of your organizations, has become ever-present throughout all of our systems, not only within the hospitals where it started, but now expanding out into the physician organizations and the ambulatory care sites as well. But where I wanted to focus the balance of my time is in that lower right quadrant, and that's population health. Focusing on the triple lane roadmap, what we set forth as a roadmap uh, heading down this new path that many of us in our careers hadn't proceeded down before. Focused on ACOs, bundling, and then a bit about palliative care. We asked consumers 
uh, meeting with them in focus groups over the course of time, how they viewed the health system uh, in, in their region. And these were the words, and you've seen these little wordles before. I don't know why they tip them sideways, I guess just to mess with you. Um, but the, the, the size of the font indicates how frequently the uh, word came up. And you can see words that none of us are terribly proud of. Disease focused, well of course, that's how we were paid. And the sicker they were, by golly, the more money we made. Uh, uncoordinated, unstructured, understaffed, underfunded, duplicated. How many times have you gone into the same uh, physician's office and had to fill out the same stupid paperwork every time and I wonder why can't they get this right? The, my airline, every single airline I use knows exactly who I am and where I'm going. Well this is what we decided we wanted to become and these are the words that the focus group said if the health system was ideal to serve my needs these are the kinds of words I would like to see. Now not all of them are easy to obtain particularly in the U.S. healthcare system, which is still somewhat siloed, and we're trying to knock down some of those silos. In memorial care, we, uh, when we are heading down a new path, whether it be the uh, implementation uh, and installation of our electronic medical record throughout the health system or our journey toward population health and a host of others, we have what we call deep dives. Some of you do these as well, where we get a group of people together, usually a large group with physicians and other clinicians and managers and folks from the community and, and uh, some of our board members, et cetera, and we, we spend an entire day sometimes in detailed discussion facilitated on those topics. Now, what is this you have before you? If you've never seen one of these before, it's frankly when I, when I decide it's time to hang up my uh, healthcare administration hat, uh, I'd love to have a job like this. Uh, this is an artist uh, who who's, comes to a company meeting or a meeting of a church or in our case at our health system and is with us the entire day and she's got this 15 foot long piece of paper across the wall and she's drawing what she hears and she's drawing and she's making notes and whatnot, and then she takes that away and then she completes it. And so basically what she's created is what we all said, and that is on the left side where we came from, and as you move across toward the right side, where we are today, where we're going, and where we need to be. And we have one of these for our EMR uh, journey that is uh, proudly displayed uh, in the health system, and folks can come by and see, now I, I see where you guys came from and where you wanted to be and now where you are today, and, and it kind of reinforces this kind of activity. This is with it on population health. Uh, so if, uh, it was hard to see from your seat, that's what that uh, represents. So I'll, I'll make my, focus my comments in these four areas and our roadmap toward population health. Strategic oversight is key in any new endeavor uh, that any of us uh, pursue. Uh, shared learning, which I think is one of the greatest benefits uh, of being part of an integrated health system, but also learning from others. I mentioned uh, a reference to Sharp Health System earlier. I could mention Sutter and Cedar sinai and a host of others uh, that we work with on a regular basis, learning from each other because we're similar in many regards, culturally and in our vision and where we think uh, we, we need to be going. I'll, I'll talk about a bit of that. Test of change. Uh, these are effectively pilot projects that we do in one of our delivery sites or maybe a combination of a couple of them and if it works there because we have a common culture and common systems and common processes across the entire health system, if it works here, it can be expanded throughout the health system. And we can have multiple of these going on at any given time and we do. And then the strategic leadership, which is absolutely key. So focusing on strategic oversight, number one, following in the path of what all of us have in our companies and frankly pretty much every company in the country uh, of a financial close where you get together every month and you have your controllers and your CFOs and your managers dissecting your financial performance and identifying where you need to make improvements and celebrating success and setting a course for the future. We have financial closes. You all have financial closes. We also have a quality close where we review our quality performance in our health system and set new bold goals. We have a strategy close every month where we get people together to talk about the strategic developments in the system to make sure everybody's on board with all of this activity going on in the health system. So we're big on closes. We have a revenue close to make sure our managed care people are in sync with where the health system is developing so they don't get across purposes with each other. We decided that system works, that process works, that discipline works. Let's try it with population health. And so we created the population health steering close, which means on a monthly basis. Its acronym, which of course we love in healthcare, uh, happens to spell physics which I failed in college, but I'm hoping to do better this time. So what does that group do? 
Uh, it identified our initial priorities. Where do we want to go in this journey toward population health? It's, we studied our infrastructure to see where we were lacking, and like many health systems, we were lacking in several areas uh, in terms of what we need to be true population health managers. And we went through that process of the deep dive. And you can see on the right-hand side the kinds of things that, were, that came out of the deep dive, the kinds of things that we knew we had to focus upon uh, going forward. Number two, uh, shared learning. Uh, in addition to learning from some uh, within the system and, and from some of our uh, California colleagues, uh, we took a visit uh, with physician representatives and folks from management and clinicians and at least a board member uh, to UPMC. Now granted it's a different market, but they've done a lot of things very well. Uh, and they have a, a thriving health system. And we wanted to learn how do they integrate all those pieces together and work more directly with employers and partner with health plans, et cetera. So we, we took a trip there and it was invaluable. Uh, we sent a team of folks, as many of you have, to the Triple AIM Summit of IHI. And fortunately for us, uh, one of our senior executives, our chief transformation officer, uh, is very engaged and involved in the IHI and is uh, regularly uh, working with them. And then we also uh, tasked our memorial care academies with focusing on population health. Now just a moment about that. Uh, our organization uh, prides itself on, on encouraging growth from within and developing our managers as best we can. And so 18 years ago, we created a management academy, modeled a little bit after the one that GE had at the time, and many other companies uh, have them as well. We're a year-long, intense focus of a hand-picked group of managers that we thought were, had grand potential, uh, but they just needed to be exposed to more things in the health system that their day jobs wouldn't give them that exposure. Uh, and we brought them together uh, as, in, as in a leadership manner, and, and part of the, their, their learnings, in addition to reading books and lectures and working together, uh, was focusing on a particular project. And they, every t class had about four projects they divvy up into groups on. And over the years, we've given them projects that focused on population health. A few years ago, we decided to add a physician leadership academy. I think we're about to start in January either our third or fourth Physician Leadership Academy. It alternates years now. And we just started a Nursing Leadership Academy as well. So we're big on the internal education. And it's produced remarkable benefit for us. Uh, we would, many times when we see the results of their year-long study and work, we look at it and say, we would have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars with a consulting company to produce this kind of work product. And it was produced from inside the family. And, and because it was produced inside the family, it's more believable that it's something we can actually operationalize and work with. But you can see the topics that our Physician Leadership Academy and our Management Leadership Academy focused on in terms of the, our, our evolution toward population health. In addition to that, under shared learning, uh, these uh, topics came out uh, of our discussions, namely from our, uh, our, our, our deep dive. Uh, go slow to go fast. We're all in that rather awkward stage where we endeavor to focus on population health. We say we're focusing on population health, but about half of our business pays us under a population health reimbursement scheme, and about half of it doesn't. In fact, if you do it really good on that other half, you're going to be burning a lot of cash. And, and maybe people don't like to talk about that, but that is a reality. So you can do a couple of things. You can ignore that it's happening, which I'm observing some doing. You can treat your populations fundamentally differently based upon how you're reimbursed, which just doesn't feel like the right thing to do. Or you can go about in a very steady and deliberate fashion, focusing on those where population health reimbursement matches with the care and, and convert the others as quickly as you can which I frankly thought would be a lot easier than it is. When you have multi-year uh, contracts with health plans that still reimburse on kind of a fee-for-service uh, per, uh, per diem or otherwise, it's difficult to transition into something that is more akin to population health. I won't belabor all of these with you because these things are familiar to you, but we knew we had to have the teams that work together in, in, a, in a closer fashion than we had previously. Uh, Scott uh, Joslin, my chief information officer, is going to talk a bit about our big data and our IT systems that support population health here very shortly. And so we've continued down the shared learning uh, path. Test of change 
something that, uh, again, I think is one of the greatest benefits of an integrated delivery system where you can test out something at one entity and have it then, if it works, immediately ex uh, expand to the other ones as well. And so these are the, the primary entities in the Memorial Care Health System, not the only ones, but the ones that over the last couple of years have had their own tests of change. Let me just focus on one for an example because it's kind of a unique partnership. At the, on the bottom of the screen, Saddleback, Saddleback Memorial uh, has two campuses, one in uh, Laguna Hills and one in San Clemente. And uh, we've been partnered since actually before they became the IPA they are today with Monarch IPA. They've been our physician delivery vehicle for many, many years until we uh, recently we introduced an, an additional one with our own IPA and medical group. But we're still working very, very closely with the Monarch IPA and had a very good working relationship. And so the two of us together said we share risk in the senior population. There are certain things we can do to better manage these patients. Uh, and so a, a product came across our desk. Uh, I believe it was called Care Team Connect, which is a product that helps you manage certain populations of patients more effectively. It came across our desk because our innovation company, our private equity investment company that we have, had invested in it because they saw its potential as an up and coming company and one that could fundamentally bend the cost curve and improve the health of the population. And so we decided to be a pilot for this company that our sister company invested in with Monarch. The, the, the results have been staggering, far beyond what we ever imagined in terms of improving the health of that population in very definable ways, reducing readmission rates of that high readmission population from 30 now to 0.2. I mean, significant reductions in that population. Well, what puts the icing on that cake, uh, Care Team Connect, which again was a company that we had an investment in, was bought by the advisory board for a pretty penny, and so we profited handsomely. Strategic leadership uh, is a key in any of these. Uh, certainly there's a lot of people involved in focusing on this uh, journey, uh, in this case of population health. Uh, but we had to have folks that were taking the lead strategically from an IT perspective, from a transformation of the health system perspective. Physician leadership, of course, crucial, and we recently brought on a new executive uh, that has experience at, at the Hackensack Health System uh, across on the East Coast, a number of years in Kaiser, and joined our organization as the system-wide vice president for population health. So with two nurses, two doctorates of pharmacy, and two physicians, you really can't go wrong in anything that you uh, choose to pursue. This is just a quick snapshot, and it doesn't give any great detail, and I'm happy to provide this detail. In fact, it's about to come out on a publication uh, that I, I, I actually can't tell you when. I know I had to approve some proofs, and I don't know. It's been a long time since I published something, so I don't know how that process works. But it has the exact details of many of these tests of change uh, that's being put out in some journal. So it's very explicit. You can find that somewhere. Uh, so you can see the, the benefits. I mentioned the Saddleback system uh, in terms of the education and the compliance, the reduced readmission rates, but these are the kinds of things we need to be focusing on as population health managers, reducing the hemoglobin A1C levels, reducing length of stay, reducing ER visits, reducing readmission rates, returning them to home uh, at higher and higher percentages and sooner and sooner, uh, the kinds of things that all of our health systems are looking to focus on. This is uh, not an unimportant part of population health, and it's certainly one of the parts that Berwick has its focus on, and that's our controllable expense per discharge. This chart shows, uh, let me orient you to the chart uh, first, uh, it shows what our work has done over the last several years. The purple line, as you can see, is the Urban Hospital Services uh, CPI, has its uh, progressed over the course of time. The, uh, the staggered blue line, the light blue line, is Memorial Care's actual uh, expenditures in these same areas of expense that are tracked on the Urban Hospital Index. And you can see for the first few years, we were tracking right along with that trajectory as all urban hospitals in this pool. And then something happened in 2009. We began to introduce things that would, would focus on cost savings, on lean processes, on doing things fundamentally differently. We call it in our organization because like you, we love acronyms, or maybe we just can't remember the whole thing, uh, and so we have to use the acronym. We call it PLUCK, P 
PLUC, Productivity uh, Management in Labor primarily, Lean Systems, Utilization Management, and Care Model Redesign, Pluck. We've been on our Pluck journey since 2009, and the, the impact has been significant. You can see it here. The orange trend line you see is uh, trending from the year 2007 and forward, and if you can see the, the light green line, that's trending from 2011, where we are virtually flat. So that's flat controllable expense growth in spite of continuing to give raises to employees, continuing to bring on new technology, continuing to absorb expense increases from medical supply companies, and continuing to invest enormously in the health system. We've actually flattened the cost curve by, by these focuses on reducing our costs in the health system. It's also having a good impact on our uh, readmission rates. All of you participate or your health systems do in the CMS readmission penalties, a clever little system from the federal government uh, where they take away money and then force you to earn it back and you feel really good about getting back a few dollars or a few pennies of the dollar that they took away. It's a beautiful concept. Uh, and you can see in the first year, uh, I sound a little bit like Jonathan Gruber, don't they, for a minute, but I, I didn't call anybody stupid. Um, you can see in the first year of the C admission, uh, CMS readmission penalties, uh, we got almost three quarters of the money that was withheld from us by focusing on those things to improve readmission rates. In the second year, 80%, and most recently, uh, 93% of the monies that were withheld from CMS. And if we think this is just a CMS phenomenon, of course, we know that's not the case. Other health plans are preparing to adopt it as well. Now, does this say that we endeavor in year four to get a full 100%? And I will tell you quite candidly, probably not. I will actually tell you that the 7% that we didn't achieve would take far more investment uh, to achieve the 7% than it's probably worth. And so this is one where it's probably okay to hover around the mid-90s and not necessarily endeavor for a whole 100%. Uh, percent. Stars matter not only for health plans, and we're going to see that play out in spades in the coming years, uh, with the Medicare uh, Advantage stars, uh, where if you're a five star, you can market year round. If you're a four star, a little bit differently, it's gonna have a powerful impact on the growth uh, and, and, and the market share of Medicare Advantage. But it also matters with our physician organizations. And again, another reason why we reached out and brought in these long-standing physician organizations to be the infrastructure of our developing integrated delivery system. Our, our IPA is five star rated and our medical group is four and a half stars rated uh, from IHA. Uh, and if, we, if I had before us, I don't think it's on the slide, uh, SCAN Health Plan also rates the medical groups with whom they work throughout the state of California, and ours proudly are numbers one and number two. And so they do well at what they do, and our task is to continue to integrate them and expand them throughout our health system. Let me uh, share with you a story that I think exemplifies population health. This is a woman, uh, a patient of ours, uh, from our Miller Children's Hospital, which is a children's hospital up at Long Beach Memorial, named Asia. Uh, and it's a story of a young woman growing up uh, with a health system as a partner, someone who we worked with her since she was very young. And I think it shows several things, the value of having a children's hospital as part of an integrated delivery system. Uh, the value of continuity of care. One of the things we're going to be, we're seeing now, we'll be seeing more of uh, are patients like her who have diseases or illnesses that 20 years ago would have caused her not to reach adulthood, period. But today, more and more and more are reaching adulthood. Now they've been cared for very well, likely, uh, by children's hospitals. What happens when they turn 19? Children's Hospital doesn't care for them much anymore. They can't, they don't have the systems, they don't have the, the, the clinicians, the physicians by and large, so they hand them off to some adult provider in the community. No continuity of care, very little exchange of medical records. Uh, the, the caregivers all fundamentally change for these patients and they are moving in droves through our health system. So one of the benefits we think we have in our health system, and we're seeing children's hospitals throughout the state of California, begin to link themselves with adult acute hospitals. We're seeing that all over the state, and it's a phenomenal development in my opinion. We've had it since 1970, uh, where the children's hospital and the adult hospital are inextricably linked, and the care can proceed simply across the hallway of the same institution. So 
Focusing on our employees, such a key part of delivering population health, whether it be within the hospital or out in the ambulatory care centers or in our physicians' offices, et cetera. And like many of you, we endeavor to have more engaged employees because we know that engaged employees are more productive. They're happier. Uh, they, they provide more customer-centric service. And we're very pleased as we begin to head down this path that we've now received uh, the Gallup Great Workplace Award. There's only 36 or 38 given in the entire world every year, and we've received it for the last four years. And one of the areas that I think has been beneficial to us, and it really links in with, with population health, and we as a provider system, endeavoring to work more closely with the community we serve, uh, not, not necessarily only through brokers or health plans, although that will continue. And we decided how much better that we focus on our own employee population for several reasons. We, we started down this journey about seven years ago to empower our employees to maintain and improve their complete wellness. And we were passionate about it. We call it the Good Life Program. And we started it mainly because we wanted to improve their lives. We have a sincere passion for the health of our employee population and hope that that spills over to their family at home. But many of us knew it would also reduce cost because we are, like many of you, a self-insured employer. And so the employees, we act as their insurance company. Uh, and so we, can, we have lots of data and we can track it. Uh, so we began to head down this path knowing full well that healthier employers are more, employees are more productive employees, they have higher morale, focused on higher quality of care and, and service to our uh, patients. So what is the good life at Memorial Care? We've linked our benefits to our uh, employee wellness. And so if they participate in employee wellness programs and exercise programs and weight loss programs uh, and do all the uh, biometric screening uh, and fill out the health risk assessments, et cetera, they're eligible for cheaper and cheaper or less expensive and less expensive health insurance. I think one of the uh, uh, programs we have offers for an employee a, a $5 a month deduction from their paycheck. Uh, you can't get much less expensive than that if they follow the good life. And we can track all this stuff. They do nicotine uh, assessment, which is a wonderful test. You, if you haven't done one of those, you should really do a nicotine test. A cotton swab in your mouth, it's, it's, it's delightful. I'm happy to say I pass. It's been long enough since I was in college that nothing uh, still showed. <laughs> so we have uh, 18,000 employees and dependents and have been focusing on this now for seven years. And, and to be honest with you, the wellness programs, the Pilates programs, the weight management programs, the boot camps, the uh, fitness centers in every one of our facilities that is large enough to, to occupy one, uh, the encouragement of, for walking challenges and programs with Fitbits attached and linking in to the systems and all that business, uh, it's been very, very good, but primarily for morale, satisfaction, and productivity, which in and of itself is pretty powerful. In terms of truly bending the cost curve, it's tough to show the wellness programs and bending the cost curve in any finite period of time. Maybe we can show it over a couple of decades, but it's very difficult to show. However, we can focus to harken back on where I started this presentation, that is two of the areas that are, are hampering and harming our health system, and that's obesity and, and uh, chronic diseases. So we, ha we started a chronic disease management program uh, within our health system. Focusing on uh, two uh, disease states in the first year, we've now expanded that to three, and we're about to move that to five. Uh, and effectively, we, because we're the health plan, we have the clinical data, we could identify our employees who had, were either high risk for or who had a certain chronic disease. And we communicated with them and allowed them to volunteer to join a program. And we didn't know exactly how that program would work, but it would have health coaches, wellness coaches, nutrition counselors. Uh, they would be involved in focus groups or, or social support groups if that was necessary. Uh, but we just wanted to try it out for several reasons. One, it's the right thing to do. Two, it's benefiting our employees. Three, it's helping us advance our own population health efforts. And four, quite frankly, if we can demonstrate it as a test of change within our health system, I'm in a far better position to go to employers and say, I've been there, I've done it. We know what works, we know what doesn't work. And I'll tell you one thing that doesn't work, which I thought was a grand idea, which tells us all the value of actually asking the consumer. I thought the social support groups, that is the employees who are identified as pre-diabetic, you know what, why not? Why wouldn't they all like to get together and talk about things they're doing and their successes and whatnot? Terrible idea. They hated the concept, they refused to show up because no employee wants their work colleague to know that they're pre-diabetic. 
So we scrapped the concept for them getting together in little social groups. However, imagine if you were a, a, had diabetes or you were pre-diabetic and your employer came to you and said, I'm going to give you a health coach who will meet, you, meet with you during work hours uh, twice a month, a dietitian who will help you to learn to eat, cook, and shop for food, monthly field trips to shop or walk on the beach, a disease management nurse and a pharmacist to help you manage your medications and communicate with your doctor, and will pay for 100% of your medicine. Would you participate? Well, we found out that they did. And you can see the results from, uh, I think this is going in from years two to year three. We now have year four data coming out. 84% participant retention, 92% uh, compliance with medication. Now that number in and of itself is not terribly significant until you know where it came from. And this I'm somewhat chagrined to say because after all, the word health and the word medical is on the paycheck of every employee and probably on their name badge. And we are at a staggering 39% medication compliance with these populations. That explains a little bit why we have this issue of chronic disease management. So we've now moved that to 92, and I've seen a peak at the newest data, and it's even higher. 50% achieved or maintained a body mass index below 25, so they're probably closer to Colorado than they are to uh, Arkansas. Uh, diabetes, uh, I'm not a clinician, uh, but I occasionally play one. Uh, and the hemoglobin A1C reduction of 0 0.9, I'm told is clinically sin significant, as is that blood pressure drop. So these are the initial statistics we've seen from this focus on our, pop our, our employee population that fits in these chronic disease categories. This is something we can continue to expand upon, again, to benefit the health system, to benefit the health of our employees, and that we can bring out to our employer partners and help them do what they can't do on their own. What it do from a financial perspective? Well, we can see that on a per capita cost basis, comparing it to a national trend, we could look, I suppose, at California trends. Over five years, we've seen healthcare expenditure rate go up about 8.5%. At Memorial Care, in the last five years, we've seen it go up 3.5%. So we've been able to bend that cost curve, and this includes all the investment in the health coaches, the wellness coaches, the nutrition counselors, and paying for the medication for these uh, folks. So final uh, slide, uh, the, the, the focus of population health, it's not easy. It's not something that, frankly, many of us have done in our careers. Many of our systems have not done this either. We've been focused more on very episodic disease management kinds of activities. When they're sick, by golly, we do well. But that whole process of re-engaging re them in their employer site or in the community, bringing them back uh, to wellness and keeping them there is not something that we've done terribly well. And again, quite frankly, the reimbursement systems in this country have certainly not rewarded that kind of behavior. But we're moving there, and we're moving there fairly quickly. I can't decide if I wish it was like a toggle switch. And by golly, on, on, on January 1 of 2015, we would all be paid on global cap or on some truth, something that truly aligns with population health or we allow this to progress over the next two or three or four years where we have one foot on the dock and one foot in the canoe and we're trying to navigate that as we're moving toward doing the right thing. But these are the kinds of things that we're focusing our time on today. Uh, focusing on the education with our providers and staff and frankly our governance. For my, uh, in our, my health system, one of my greatest challenges was dealing with board members, very engaged and involved board members. We've got multiple, multiple boards in the health system. Many of our board members have been affiliated with the health system in some manner or form for 15, 20, 25, 30 years. So for the lion's share of that time, their orientation has been, we run hospitals, we spend a lot of money on hospital equipment, the capital budgets we have go largely within the four walls of the hospital. And the, imagine the evolution from a governance perspective, people who take their jobs pretty seriously about approving expenditures in the health system, as now I'm spending the lion's share of the capital outside the walls of the hospitals and keeping the hospitals from feeling like they're second-class citizens because at the end of the day, that's still where the lion's share of the assets sit and the revenue comes from, but they know we're evolving in, in this fashion. So it, it really takes that focus of education. We want to leverage our medical foundation because we believe the integration of providers Hospitals, ambulatory sites, and physicians is absolutely critical. Uh, our health plan, which uh, is called Seaside Health Plan, we will continue to expand. We're now participating. Uh, we, we opted not to move down the path of the Pioneer ACOs 
and looking back, I'm actually happy about that decision. Uh, we decided rather to do more commercial ACOs because they were more flexible and we could kind of craft them to fit our uh, population and geography. And now we're moving into the bundle payment program that is offered by uh, the federal government. Uh, we're continuing with these tests of change in the system. Again, one of the great benefits of being in an integrated system that has similar cultures, similar systems, similar processes, uh, is being able to test things in small areas and then expand them elsewhere. In fact, we're beginning to do some tests with, with innovation and technology at a, in a health system that is not part of the Memorial Care Health System, but it's one that we line up with uh, in many respects, and they're testing things, and if it works for them, we're pretty certain we can embrace that and utilize it to our benefit in our health system. The payer strategy is not unimportant. It's not something that we talk about a lot, uh, but it's, it's, it's been, as I mentioned, a greater challenge to evolve them more toward uh, population health uh, reimbursement or something that aligns with that. Employee health will continue to be important to us because we're passionate about that and it's shown great benefit. Mr. Joslin will talk about our big IT and a data plan that will support movement toward population health and truly delivering it in a way that we had never envisioned uh, before. Uh, like many of your health systems, we're expanding both horizontally and vertically. We're now looking at clinical integration across our health system. Do we really need seven robots that do surgery? I don't think so. Uh, the local markets kind of demanded those pesky little $2 million doubles, but I don't know that we need that many of them. Uh, do I need all these high-level heart programs? Probably not. Uh, I mean, if you look at Kaiser, which is really a great example of an integrated delivery system, they certainly don't have every single tertiary program at every single site. I mean, that's just silliness, but they have a very, if you will, captive population. As our health systems are moving more and more toward tailored networks around a certain population, uh, we're going to see greater opportunity to do that kind of thing. In fact, one example of that, and it's where I'll conclude my remarks this morning, is that thing called Vividi. I have take absolutely no responsibility for the name, but I will tell you somebody paid a pretty penny to some organization that prides itself on selecting names and fonts and colors, and I have to look at it because I looked at the other names as well, and I hated them all equally. Um, <laughs> I just say, Barry, you're not a marketing guy. It's none of your damn business. Just let them do what they're paid to do. After all, they were paid to do it. Uh, and it has deep meaning, which I won't bore you with, the roots of the word in Latin and Spanish. It's really quite exciting to somebody. Um, we didn't know what Vividi would be uh, or what, what kind of attention it would get when it was announced, uh, I don't know, it was six weeks or so ago. Um, we knew what we were endeavoring to do was somewhat unusual. And frankly, I can recall remarking to my board several times over the course of the last year the likelihood of this coming together, <laughs> don't put it in my, in my, my assessment for my, my bonus, because I'm just not sure if we can get these seven health systems to truly, truly partner. What is Vividi? Very quickly, and I'm going to finish with uh, here, heretofore unseen uh, advertisement. Uh, that I don't know where it's going to go out on social media and maybe on, on, on ABC television. I'm not sure uh, that it kind of explains it. But effectively, it is a joint venture by Seven Health System, which is comprised of 14 hospitals, working with their integrated physician delivery systems, so it's 6,000 physicians that span all of LA County and all of Orange County, partnered in this joint venture with equal ownership with a health plan, Anthem Blue Cross. Uh, so we're all one-eighth owners. Uh, we're sharing a community pool. So risk side, risk both upside and downside is shared equally across all of these entities. And we're setting quality gates uh, for any monies left over at the end of the year to determine how we'll distribute those, those funds. Uh, and, and the work now before us is operationalizing that because it's going live January 1st, uh, which was particularly striking, a word leaked out about Vividi way before it was supposed to, uh, to this little organization that you may be familiar with called CalPERS. Um, they liked the concept. They didn't really believe it would necessarily come together as quickly as it did, but they said if it does, we want to make sure we have board approval to offer it to our employees in LA and Orange County starting January 1, 2015. In 48 hours, they brought it to and received approval from their board to offer Vividi to the CalPERS network in LA and Orange County. That was the first real realization for me that, man, this actually might do something. So with that, uh, I think we can take maybe a few minutes for questions if you have any. And if not, uh, I think uh, I'll, somebody will tell me what I'm supposed to do. Any questions that I can answer about Vivity or otherwise? And we have, mic we have microphones here. <laughs> John, up front here. 
you're a CEO of a very well-respected health system, also from an IT perspective. I'd love your perspective as what um, of the IT work that you've done are you most proud, and what are you most challenged by? Gee, that's a better question for C Mr. Joslin. CIO, that's, yeah. Exactly. While the CIO sits in the front, and we have a, a, a capital budget meeting coming up shortly where I'm sure IT will dominate <laughs> as it does each and every time. But I'm told it's all about value. Uh, perhaps the, the proudest of, of, of recent, the one I'm, I'm most excited about that is, is, is developing, and I think Scott's probably going to touch upon this, is the work in the data, the data warehouse. Uh, it's been ongoing now for a little over three years, going into the fourth year of what we think is a five-year plan. And to me, the, the, the benefits that that can, and it fits perfectly with where we're at in our evolution of population health. So that is kind of on the come. The one, frankly, and it's, it's now almost feels like old news, uh, and that was the, uh, the EMR. Uh, and, and all of you know this because you all lived this, and maybe some of you had to change jobs because of this. Uh, but, but installing an EMR with clinicians, particularly physicians, particularly chronolo chronologically gifted physicians, who couldn't even type, for goodness sakes, and I've witnessed many of them pecking away like a, a 1940 reporter on a typewriter, uh, and, but it basically fundamentally changing the way they approach their work. That's dangerous work. And I can recall telling our board when we brought the approval of the EPIC EMR for the system to the board, uh, you know, certainly this is about where we need to go. It's about quality. It's about patient safety. There's a whole host of things. And I've got a lot of bankers on my board, and one of them had asked the question, will there be a return on this investment? And I said there's a good chance if within six months we can get maybe half the physicians to enter their orders consistently uh, on the, the electronic medical record. It happened within hours because of the work that the, the thoughtful work that our teams did leading up to the, the big, uh, the go live. Uh, we, we had a, a psychologist that was a specialist in change management, helping to work with these folks. Uh, and we used a, a team of, of, of specialists that we likened to the pharmaceutical sales reps, as you know, who get very close to physicians and can influence their behavior and service them very, very well and, and had them out in to the physician offices and throughout the, all the medical centers. And one by one, the hospitals went live with that same level of success. To me, that was, and I'm still looking at some hospitals today. I mean, you say you have an EMR and I say, who cares? Of course you do, you should. Uh, how much is it being utilized? How much is it interconnected? What kind of warnings and, and red flags you have built in to fundamentally change the way we deliver care? Uh, the greatest challenge, other, other than the insatiable capital appetite, um, you know, I, I think it's going to be how we, we make sense out of all this data that we're going to have access to. We have access to some of it now, and now with a health plan and certain partnerships, uh, we're, we're bringing in more and more data, and it just boggles my mind as, as how we're going to make that useful in a way that's not like a university professor looking at retrospective data, all well and good, but doesn't help us much today. Other questions? Other questions? Well, as one of those professors, um, I was curious about your workforce development. Where are you going to hire the, uh, the workforce that you need to do this? You're talking about big data. Uh, so uh, what are your workforce challenges to achieve what you want to do? You know, I'll touch uh, broadly on that, and then I think Scott can probably talk a bit more in detail about within specifically the IT area. But workforce is a big deal for all of us. Uh, and, and one of the areas we, we headed down a path on, if you can remember back when there was a nursing shortage, uh, so it, it predates the, the recession, and it was, it was dire in our hospitals, and I'm starting with nursing and we'll expand from there. Uh, we had at any given time uh, nurses from 13 different states and two or three different countries that we had in our hospitals just to service the needs of the hospital, and I will tell you at great expense. And I can never forget a meeting with who was the then president of California State University Long Beach, who had has or maybe still has the largest nursing RN bachelor program uh, in the state of California. And we were chatting over lunch about our respective woes. I was bitching about health care, and he was complaining about the state budgets. Uh, and he said, by the way, I, I should let you know uh, that we are going to uh, reduce significantly our nursing program. I said, what do you mean? I don't have a nurse, enough nurses as it is. I'm paying a fortune to have them come from Louisiana and hang out in, you know, in, in apartments here in Southern California. Why would you do that? And he said, it's very simple. It's about money. 
the, the nursing program requires one faculty person for every 10 nurses. In accounting, I can have one faculty person for 50. They require skills labs. There's no such thing in accounting. It's simple economics. I cannot continue to support it. And frankly, I don't have enough staff to teach the, the nurses as I need to teach them. And we thought about it back at the organization. We, we've got what could be adjunct professors called masters and doctor prepared nurses who are coming close to the end of their career, at least as a floor nurse, and want to do something fundamentally different to give back to the organization. We have space, for goodness sake, certainly at Long Beach Memorial. I'm sitting on 69 acres of space. We own apartments and houses uh, waiting for people to kick off so I can knock the house down and use it for a parking lot. That was rather crass, wasn't it? <laughs> it's a healthcare guy. So we have space, we have faculty. Could we satellite the entire nursing program from Cal State Long Beach onto the campus of our hospital and expand it? And we'll do one better than that. The nursing program took six semesters to get through, three years after two years of general ed. We, let's, we said, let's do it year round and make it a trimester system so they can get out faster. And let's do it one better. I'll pay for all the tuition and books and guarantee them a job. Uh, if they work for me for two years after, I, after they graduate. And that program started at 75, went to 108, went to 180. Today, at this very moment, I probably have 450 of our nurses in training, and we're hiring about 95% of them. Uh, and the ones we don't go back to Hawaii, where I frankly can't blame them uh, where they came from. Uh, so it's been invaluable, and they're trained on our systems, which is even better. Well, that program works so well in nursing, to your point. We expanded it to uh, therapists, and um, including IT. And the IT area is one that I think we could do more on, because as many of you, uh, as we're continuing to expand and, and, and force this integration, which is so critical, uh, the IT is so critical for that, uh, we're finding ourselves having to bring in resources from the outside, uh, and a lot of them. And, and, and while that's great and they bring great talent, I, I'd much rather have homegrown people. Uh, and so it's, it's really, a, it's, it's, it's one of the areas we need to focus on. Any other questions before I completely exceed my time? Please join me in thanking Thank you. Mr. Arbuckle. Thank you.